going to pray. Father, this morning, fresh, we draw an eye into your presence. And thank you, Father, for meeting the fashion according to your word. We always say it quite often. Father, we thank you that we're able to draw aside from all things of life and meet you. Father, we just thank you. Father, this morning, may we become aware of your presence, Father. And Father, more and more as we go on in these dark days, Father, may the light of God's word and the light of the word lead and guide us and illuminate us more. Instead of us walking in darkness, Father, we walk in the light. And Father, we, we would hear your voice and we would be stilled. And Father, we would just you know, rejoice more in the tremendous revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ left us. And we thank you that Jesus could say the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Just want to the Spirit of the Lord upon me and his anointing to preach. Thank you for it. You know, I was saying on Friday night that I think a school prize given day for the children, and maybe there's six or seven other children at the school, and there's so many of us picked out. One of my granddaughters thinks she gets a prize for things. I'm, I'm not one for that. I don't like that. And as I was going out, I met the teacher and I said, Where's all the rest of the children? Well, they're off today. Now, here's Listen, you, you maybe don't know this, but that's the same in the way they work the word and the same in the way they work the schools. I sad to say the same way they work in, in uh, church. Now, this man, Russ up, he's talking to his father in ice cream. He started years ago as an ice cream man, and he went and he went into all these different things, became a very motivating person, motivating. But he came back here and he started to do his job. He says, this is my purpose now. And I started school and I planned this and I worked hard. And I done all this and I done this and I strived. And here's the key. That's exactly the way I was taught and everyone else was taught. And I'm sitting back the background shaking my head. I think so. He says, you're here and God wants you. I know, so not God. He says, we want you to strive for your purpose. I don't know why you think, you know what, you maybe know it, but you're not maybe too aware of it. Right, okay, now listen, the word that came to me yesterday was awareness, awareness. Now, there's a verse coming out of my mind, so I was thinking this. I just want to show you these verses. One's found in 2 Timothy 1 verse 9. 2 Timothy 1 verse 9. And you don't realise... We have been programmed, everyone, everyone in school today is programmed the same way. And in business, the same. Okay? Uh, second time of conversion. Who saved us and called us for the holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose. Now, years ago, I read that verse and saying, and I found for the first time in my life, God has a purpose for me. And it's his own purpose. It's not what I want. See, I, I wish every one of us would in your spirit according to his own purpose. Not your purpose. Not what everybody else is telling you to do or trying to put you down, pushing you down. According to his own purpose. On grace, which was given us before the foundation of the world. Now, tell me this. If you know you, there's a purpose for you in life, and God's purpose, God has His own purpose for you. How are you gonna? How are you gonna juggle all the things that's in your life to make that happen? Okay. Now, as I was sitting thinking this, the first came to my mind, and we know all things work. We know all things work for our good. Okay, who was it? And we know all things work together for good to them that are, love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. See, so when you get saved, you were called and saved according to his purpose. You've been called for his purpose. And everybody else has been trying to probe their on you for their purpose. Or telling you, the job you've got, that's your purpose. Am I right? If everybody be honest, 
That's exactly it. So you know why I started to work? And my idea was, I'm going to work and I'm going to get money. Right? But that's the way the world's programmed. This is a totally different thing here. If you've been honest about things, it's totally different. You know what's this wee bit? If you go to Psalm 57, here's the psalmist David had grasped how to get God's purpose to work in his life. And I'm going to read this in a new level translation. Psalm 57. And we hear what I'm going to say here. The program that you and I have been on that will never produce that purpose. Okay. But here's the problem. That's the way the world operates. By motivating and inspiration. And everybody loves it. After all this, this is lovely. I got these people on and then I got this for and then I got this. And then I got these people and some of the school girls as well. And that's the way we're programmed in the world, the spirit of the world. Psalm 57. Have mercy on me, O God. Have mercy. I look to you for protection. I will hide beneath the shadow of your wings until the danger passes by. I cry out to God most high, to, go, to God who fills his purpose for me. I see that verse good. Can I ask you a question? Who's going to fulfill your purpose? I'm sad to say I give you the, I give you the answer. Who's going to fulfill your purpose? Most of us will never be able to go there. Because you've got a mindset of how to think, make things work in the nature and in the world and how the world system works. Most of us will never get that. Because there's other people out there and they will motivate you and take you off and do things. And really, at the end of the day, whatever way we are, we're programmed people and we seem to want to see success. I'll give you an example. I said a wee verse on Friday night, and it's Judge 6. And I remember years and years ago sitting in the house. You see that verse there I read there, Psalm, Psalm 57. To God who fulfills his purpose for me. Who fulfills, who fulfills my purpose? Who, who fulfills it? No, not me. If I'm looking for me and striving for me to fulfill this purpose, I will never get the purpose of it. It's, I have to come to a place where I let God fulfill his purpose for me. Did you hear what I said there, please? You will never fulfill this purpose. Never. You used to say, say it in our way, as long as, the, what was they say, as long as the cows can become themselves, you'll never do this. It's only God can do it. Let me show you what you think. Listen, the way it is the day we get saved, we're striving, we're trying to do this, never is trying to make you do things. There's a bottle of water there. God only wants you to be a spout, a chum. He doesn't want you to do nothing. He wants to be a channel for him to flow through you. Now listen, I have a cup, and I make a mess if I don't. If I start to empty that bottle out there, that would empty, there's the cup and there's the bottle. That would go through the channel if I took the top off. But if there's other things in there blocking this and flowing, that will never work. And here's the key. The spirit of the word has programmed us to do things. And it's all in the spirit of the word of you doing this, and you achieving this, and you making this happen. And then we have other leaders who are motivating you and telling you, listen, I done this, this we need to do, you need to go on this. You will never fulfill those works. You'll never fulfill the well, you'll fill your own fulfill your own works. And you might get all this. You may listen, a read verse of scripture, I'm not sure what's that, maybe Mark something. What shall a profit a man gain the whole world in which his soul? Now listen, here's what I'm trying to tell you. I, God has his own purpose for you. And I want to try and tell you this morning how you can prioritize 
how to be that vessel to fulfill those works. You see that there? I'll get rid of that. Listen. Now listen, there's a man, David, in Old Testament. And here's another thing. Please listen to what I say here. I've been through a lot of stuff in life. And most of us, when things come on at night to us, we lay there. I remember going to the mosque one time and we had a tractor and all of a sudden she started to spin. And we were silly enough to keep spinning. And instead of going forward, we were down. We were just buried in the And all I'm just saying to you is, if you're living in the past, you will never be able to move on to your future. Now, you have to learn how to deal with the past. But listen, the past is not meant to be, the past is meant to be in the past. You hear what I said there? Where's the past meant to be? In the past. Now, if that past is your present, could I tell you this? You'll not be able to reach to go forward with what is for you. Now, listen. Your secret to the whole thing is live in tomorrow, or everybody say now, live in the future, what God says. Now, what we show you, have show you this. Judges chapter 6. Judges 6, verse 12 and 13. Now, here's God coming to this man. Now, just listen. I was sitting in the house one morning, the exact same thing. And God spoke to me at this verse. And I was in the problems, and I was in the past, and I did not see the future. Did you hear what I said there? Judges 6, right? no, sorry, Judges 6, 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 I'm not trying to be. I'm blessed beyond all measure, not beyond great. That's who God says I am. I'm not looking at the past or struggling this. This is who God says I am. So I move on to the future what God says I am. Not I was lived in a chair. I was in six children's home and left home at 14 and a half and all this stuff. And that. No, I've moved on. Judges chapter 6. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee. See, the child of God is one. The spirit of the living God. Are you aware of that? I've got a word up here, awareness. Are you aware that the spirit of the living God now lives in? And we hear what the, spirit, the angel of the Lord said to Gideon. Thou mighty man of honor. What did he say to him? Here's what he told him. Here's what you are. What do you think? Get in work. Well, if you go back through this story, but, uh, and get it said, Oh, my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why is all these problems? Why is all this before us? And where be all his miracles? Which our fathers told us of sin. So if you read the story, Gideon shut himself away, and he shut, if you read verse 1, the children of the evil sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Midianites. And Midian, and the hand of the Midianites prevailed against Israel. And this is where God comes along, and Gideon was in the middle of living in this mess. God, the God of heaven is not here anymore, and did do and all this stuff. He's living, and he goes and he starts to do things himself, and he builds things and all that stuff. Sort of, and then the angel Lord comes to get him. The Lord is with thee. Now listen. I want to tell you one thing: unless you are aware of the spirit of the living God lives in you, you will never live in the revelation of the presence of God. The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of God. Now that's what God's seen Gideon. 
God wasn't looking in Gideon of him and the man and standing walking around, around in the wine press. Gideon, you've got mighty man of honour. I'm with you. Right? And Gideon said unto him, Ah, oh, but look at all this stuff. So where was Gideon now? Now that's what I'm trying to say to you. See when the Lord comes to me and said, See me, that's where I was looking. And I was looking around at all the problems. And I was looking around at all this stuff. I know what the Lord says to me, well, that's not you. This is you here. And I want to tell you that. Do not, you had to get a revelation. God has his own purpose for you. God has his own purpose. And everybody else, including your own mindset, will try and work out this purpose. But listen, that's how God sees everything else. We are mighty men and women of valor. You know why? The Lord's with you. You know, it's here. I learned a wee phrase years ago. One plus the Lord is a majority. One plus the Lord is a majority. And you know, it's here. I don't want to stay there. I want to try and move on here. But listen, I'm going to say to you. <clears throat> Unless you're aware of the Spirit of God in you, some people will come along, even at an Alpha course, and ask and pray for you to receive the Spirit. I do not need to receive the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is living in me. And if you're asking for a Spirit to come in, where the Spirit of God is, what Spirit is that? It's the Spirit of the world. Please. And the verse that you use is Luke 13. How much more should your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those that ask him? Listen, the night you get saved now, God comes to live inside you. But Luke 13, verse 11. And I'm not criticizing. Right, where's your message? If I can find it. That's not even 13. You see, somewhere in there. What's this? I can't see the verse. What do you mean? Uh, right. Luke 11 verse 13. If ye then be evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall heaven the Father give the Holy Ghost to them? Ask. So they're saying, ask for the Holy Spirit. Listen, the night you get saved, God came to live inside your spirit. Forever. And he's never going to leave. And all I'm just saying this morning is, are you aware the Spirit of God out of me. And everywhere you walk about, and everywhere you go, you are a carrier of the indwelling Spirit of God. John 14, verse 6. That was a bad <coughs> John 14, verse 16. Just, right. Right. No, sorry. John 14, verse 16. And I pray the Father, and he will give you a comfort, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of Truth. John 14, verse 16 and 17. Jesus is coming along, he's saying to say, later on, when I go, the comfort is going to come. And he's going to abide with you forever. Right? Even the Spirit of Truth, whom the Word cannot receive, but the child of God receives the Spirit of Truth. And the Spirit of Truth comes to live inside you forever. By the way, you don't need to ask for the Spirit. You need to acknowledge the Spirit of God lives in. Believe in verse 6. Thy faith becomes effective by acknowledging. Of every good thing that's in me. We hear this. The spirit of the living God now lives in me. And what am I doing? I'm acknowledging the spirit of God. And the more and more you speak that, the more and more you become aware of this indwelling presence of God. Now what's this? 
Dear, dear. You know what's here? I want to try and show you this morning a wee thing here. The car. And it's... See, on a Sunday morning, years ago, the Lord told me to take a Sunday school at St. Mary's. And every time I've tried to take to go to that Sunday school, always something crawl up. So eventually the Lord moved on and the Sunday school was moved up to here. And I found that even everything was there when you started to come to the meeting, as everything was becoming and trying to get away. Now I'm not saying that's the good thing. I come to the revelation, I'm going to set myself apart and I'm going to go down here roughly about half a year. On Sunday morning, leaving a Friday night, Friday, remember, I was going down there. And you was here, I come in here, now we we have we have teaching online there, but we never very rarely play music. Could I tell you this, child of God, learn to play music. If you know why, that was a great change in my life. But you know what I found out? When I come down in here, and I put on music, and I have the, no phone, no answer, no phones, no nothing, I come into a place for a lot of Sunday mornings I encounter the manifest presence of God. Not the indwelling Spirit of God, but the manifest presence of God. And you must hear, when you get a touch from the manifest presence of God, you cry for more. You hunger for more. And you know what's here, you and I have lives and different things and everything is there to try and take you away from God. There's a wee verse in James, draw nigh to God. And he will draw nigh to you. Could I ask you a question? If God is living in me, why do I need to draw near him? No, I didn't understand his presence. For this, the psalmist of your presence, in thy presence is fullness of joy. Psalm 16. You see, it? Psalm 16. I was going to try and say that's the past, but it seems that I won't end that. Psalm 16. You see, yes. I pray. Everyone here, everyone on me, will start to become aware of the indwelling of the Spirit of God, but also have a desire to take yourself away from everything else and desire the manifest presence of God. Psalm 16, verse 9, and 11. Psalm 16, verse 11. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. In the manifest presence of God is fullness of joy. There's no joy. There's fullness of joy. And at thy right hand pleasures forevermore. So never mind being a carrier at Psalm 16, verse 11. A.V. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. You know, a lot of sort of spirit and life and everything. Did I tell you this? Once you get a real touch of God in the manifold's presence, can I tell you this? Supernatural people are healed. And problems and difficulties are removed from the manifest presence of God here. And even in your mindset. And you must hear no honesty. That's not what I try and do. I can do it when I want music. I maybe do a couple of things and then I just let the let the praise music take over. And then I throw and all of a sudden maybe I'm starting to throw I think I start to thank him and praise him. And I start rejoicing. Now I'm not rejoicing in the problems. They're they're there. They're, they're not. I knew I was here on Wednesday, and I'm not talking about praise and thanksgiving and worship this morning. I'm just trying to tell you about this. the indwelling presence of God 
and then there's a manifest presence of God. And you don't need to crave for the indwelling presence, but we need to crave for the manifest presence. Right? And if you go to James chapter 4, James 4 verse 8, James 4, a different version. You know, most of us, unless we learn to realize that all everything is found in God, and I need to go to God and see what he says, and in that stillness, and in that peace, there's a tranquility there for your soul that I can't explain. James chapter 4. Verse 8. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. But he's living in me. No, no, no. I'm talking about movement. I'm getting to know and touch the manifest places. Now, it's so hard to bring this across. But listen to what I'm trying to tell you. There's something special when you become aware that God lives in you. And when you start to lift them up and praise and be thankful and draw close to him. There was a wee song there. I was on this morning there. I forget the name of it. Michael J. Smith, I said, draw, draw me close to you. Never let me go. Draw me close to you. He's living on us. But I don't think that's really talk about us living on Draw close to God. Draw me close. You're all I want. You're all I need. Let me know you're here. You know, and, and I never say this much, but in certain parts of my life, the manifest presence of God I've tapped into it. I've, not, I've tapped into it. But did I tell you this? Even there's a heat coming on me. Trust me. There's a there's a, a desire and a place to be that the song is in fact. In my presence is fullness of joy. And not thy very heart but pleasures for it all. And see the psalms, the psalms David brought things the very few as ever. But you know this here, there's another awareness here, and just when I'm here, I'm just going to be awareness. One's the awareness that God's loving it. And then there's the awareness of the stillness and presence and of the manifest presence of God. But then there, this is another awareness I want to show you. How are you going to be fulfill God's purpose for yourself? Are you aware of it here? I I show you the answer. Sir. Do you do you know how do you might bring it about or how it comes about? See, there's other people there, and they're going to stir you up by motivating you, inspiring you to get you out to serve with your gift. And by the way, God doesn't serve. God wants you. God wants to think you should work done in your soul before you step out and serve. And if you don't get that, you will just go out and do things in your own strength and you will lead other people. And listen, you will move in the world. You will move in that atmosphere of motivation and inspiration. And then when I e other ones don't come on this, like I ask them what teacher say, where's the rest of the school? Oh, they get a day off. So it's only the ones who received the prize who achieved. So what about the not achievers? I, I went into school at the wee girl and, and the wee boy and this year he's walking home and the rain was on. He says, Grandma, you know I'm walking home this year. So off he went marching in the rain. From now on, I say, have me a book But listen, Grandma, you know I'm walking. I'm walking home. He went out. Country. And after the week girl, and this other girl was standing beside him, her girl was 
the second tee got big cuts and all and stuff. And they said, that was a great thing down below. I says, I, I just don't agree with that. What do you mean? I says, tell me this, what about the rest of the school? Ah, oh, but you must motivate the other ones. I says, I don't want the rest of the school. What about the non-achievers? See, that's, that's the way we are today. We want the achievers to work for us, to be the leaders, to inspire everybody else in church. And that's what the church has done. And we've just moved into the world system in the world's ways. But why so is this? How, how do I become aware of how to get God's own purpose to work for me? Right? I hopefully nobody's fell out with me. But here's the key. I feel empathy for those who don't achieve the way the world wants. Now, I don't feel sympathy. What's the difference between sympathy and empathy? Sympathy means you feel for them. Empathy means you feel for them, you want to do something about it, and you want to move on and help them. See, if I was one of them boys, I would be a, I'd be one of them boys to put a day off from it. Now, I know what you think of me. Listen to us here. God's plan is totally different. Now, listen, for the back to this, you have to go back to the cross. And you need to go to Galatians chapter 6. The man rang me this week, and next thing he, he was talking about this part of this, Galatians 6. And see on the cross, Christ died for our sins. But on the cross also, and I can only apply this to me, Wally Sprout died with Christ on the cross. Galatians 6 verse 14. But God forbid that I should glory safe in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. So I was co-crucified with Christ on the cross. I've never, ever, ever forgotten to come here. Next verse. For in Christ Jesus, now circumcision of your end, are uncertain by new creation. Now I became a brand new creation. What happened in my past? My past gone. I remember talking to somebody who has a past, and it's not very good, and everybody's going to bring up through up to you. God's not going to You're a brand new creation. But listen. That verse there, and you get you to understand this, if you go to Galatians 2 verse 20, Paul identified himself as dying with Christ on the cross. Right? In Galatians 2 verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. On the cross I was crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Remember I told you, God now lives in you. We here would have put a go there. God wants to work in you. God lives in you, but he wants to work in you. And he's the one that's going to bring the purpose about. Now he can't work in you unless you have yielded it. Your will never happens. But Paul was a yielded vessel. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live yet I Christ lives in me. On the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. So he identified himself, I died with Christ in the cross. I don't live anymore. Christ lives. And see from now on, I live by the faith of the Son of God. That's the goal of six. If you go to six, and if you have different, maybe you struggle with a different version, you won't be the AB or vice versa. Go, go you to Romans chapter 6, and I will read it, I should translate. Right? What was it then? Romans 6, very early. Yeah, Romans 6. I want you to become aware of your purpose. Sorry, God's own purpose for you. Not your purpose. Romans chapter 6. I'm saying my heart I feel the body of Christ is totally a wee bit deceived because they never find out God's purpose Him doing the purpose with you. But you yield. You've died with the cross. Now you yield yourself as that person. 
And when you go into the waters of baptism, you're going in there identifying yourself, I died with Christ. I'm not alive anymore. I have no free will. This is the last you see. I'm going in here. I'm rising, rising up on you. With no free will. Here it's in there. With no free will. But people still there. And now I am God's servant. And a servant only does what the master says, not what he thinks. Right. Romans chapter 7. You read all that down yourself, but I'm going to read this from verse 15 in the Passion. The heading of the Passion is this Grace frees us to serve God. Right. What are we to do then? Should we sin to our heart's content since there is no law to condemn us anymore? What a terrible thought. Don't you realize that grace frees us to choose your own master? Right? Choose carefully. For you surrender yourself to become a servant bound to the one you choose to obey. So if you've never if you've never yielded and yoked yourself to the God and the Lord Jesus Christ, you are a servant to your flesh. And you are a servant to the spirit of the word. You're a servant to the spirit of error, and you're a, spirit, a servant to the God of this world. So, now, now watch this you bit. Don't you, I'll read it again, don't you realize that grace free you to choose your own life? But choose carefully. For you surrender yourself to you become a servant bound to the one you choose to obey. If you choose to love sin, it will become your master. And it will own you. See, years ago, after I got saved, I went into the water of baptism, and I went in, and I could not break the power of sin in my life, and that lusts and desires to do my own thing, and my own idol. I could not break. Then, one night, I seen them verses, and I yielded myself to God. My body, my members, my mind, every me. Could I tell you yes, super nicely the spirit of God and power be to walk? And broke them all them desires for me. Because I started to follow. I yielded to him and then I started to obey. Listen, that's where you be surrender yourself to become a servant bound to the one you choose to obey. If you choose to love sin, it will ask you and you it will own you. And reward you with death. But if you choose to love and obey God. He will lead you into perfect righteousness. Positioning you are righteous by the death of Christ on the cross. But in your personal life. Your personal walk. You may struggle. Unless you're you. Because you'll not be able to walk in perfect righteousness. And you will try to do this and try to achieve. We hear this in verse 17. God is pleased with you from the past you were servants of sin, but now your obedience is hard to keep. And your life has been molded by truth through the teachings you're devoted to. And now you celebrate your freedom from your former master's sin. You've left his bondage, and now God's perfect right to his whole power over you as his loving servants. To God, when you yield completely and choose to obey God, you are now under the control of the Spirit of God. If you have never done that, you are not under the control of the Spirit of God. God lives in you. The Spirit of God lives in you. But he hasn't control of you. And that's a free choice. The next verse I will show you. Right. I've used the familiar terms of the servant and the master to compensate for your weakness to understand for just as you surrender your bodies and souls to impurity and lawlessness, which only brought lawlessness into your lives, to now surrender yourselves as servants of righteousness, which brings you deeper into true holiness. And yeah, that's the only way that God can produce holiness in your life. By yielding and yoke to that. And what you're doing there is you're giving your soul over and you're giving your soul over as a, a good heart. Fully committed to God. And now the Spirit of God has come to live inside. Sorry, not live inside. The Spirit of God has control of you to produce in you His own purpose for your life. Now, if you start to walk with God, if you ever do that, 
you'll be on say, my goodness, what's this guy on him? Step down. You'll be the Gideon. You'll maybe be all this stuff going back to the past. No, you learn to live in the future. What's God saying now? God says you're a mighty man of honor. The Lord is with you. And you're under his control. Do you hear what I'm saying now? Now, I'm sorry I didn't go over these verses, but if you go to Mark 4, you'll read what will happen when you have a good heart. That's it. A good heart is one who's went into the waters of baptism, healed it, and completely now from that point on has died to self and now is a vessel of honour. Second Timothy 2 verse 21. For God. Right? And if you go to set, set, uh, go to Mark 4, if you go to Mark 4, now listen, most of us, I remember going, I used to have a problem with, no problem, hobby. And my hobby overtook me, and I, I knew how the right was to me. I mean, the Lord told me one night, the drum, I said, stop these drums. And my wife and family never could see it. Eventually, I stopped the drums. And that's when the Lord did the desire of all them things in my life. Okay? I mean, some of us are maybe struggling. and thinking, what's wrong with that? If you are making an idol of the thing, where's God? Where's God? Who's first? Okay. God wants to be first in God. Do you know why? When you draw a night to God, he draws a night to you. And you will start to experience the manifest presence of God as God, you let God do everything in your life. Now we said Romans chapter 4. I'm going to go through this very quickly. First, Rome, sorry, Mark, 4, sorry, Mark 4 verse 20. And these are they which are sown on good ground. A good ground is a good heart. A good ground is a fully committed heart. I'll show you in a second too. Such as hear the word. You start to hear the word then. What do you do? You start to personally hear the word. As you read the word, you never mind hear it. You receive it. See, it says in that verse there. And they are which are sown on good ground. Hear the word and receive it. And bring forth for it. So your life starts to become fruitful. And the word of God becomes fruitful in your life. Now if you go to Matthew 12, 13. Same parable. Matthew 13 verse 12. Now. I'll read verse 11. It is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom. But to them that are not. For whosoever hath to him will be given. Now see if you have not put it there. Now, God wants you to mature as you walk with this good heart. And God wants to lead your life by revealing the scriptures to you. Personally. Okay. Matthew 13, verse 12. If you ever found someone that has really a desire, look the end of these verses for yourself and see this for yourself. Matthew 13, verse 12. For whosoever has spiritual knowledge to him more will be him. And he will even be furnished richly so that he'll have abundance. But from him who is not, even what he has will be taken away. For God wants to enrich your life with spiritual knowledge. Coming directly from God because of the condition of your heart. Now, if you read Matthew 13, verse 23, but he that receives seed in, into the good ground, it's he that heareth the word and understands it. So you read the word. And Mark 4 says you receive it. And Matthew 13 says you hear the word and you understand it. Why do you understand? Because of the condition of your heart. And you're yoked to the Spirit of God. And you're yielded, sorry, yielded to the Spirit of God. Right? And also bear fruit. Now if you go to Luke 8, verse 18. We do you hear on God's sake? God wants to lead your life by the revealing of the Scriptures to you. He wants you to know it, hear it, Receive it and understand. 
And the problem lies, it's your heart. If you go with me to Luke 8, verse 18, no, sorry, 15. But on the good ground are they which, with an honest, there is, with an honest and good heart. Having heard the word, keep it. So he wants you to hear the word. He wants you to receive the word. He wants you to understand the word. And he wants you to keep the word. And then you bring forth it. Because you are yoked completely to God on the Spirit of God and your heart is obeying God and now God's bringing forth fruit into your life. And you are going to be a vessel for his own purpose. Right? If you go to Second Chronicles 16, 9, I read this often. Second Chronicles 16, verse 9. You need to understand, somebody might be online and this will be the very first time they'll hear this. Or maybe you've heard it but you never applied it. I remember hearing a teacher going up one time and said, sometimes you have to speak a thing maybe up to 16 pen before somebody else hears it. 2 Chronicles 16 verse 9. I remember one night when I read this verse years and years ago, and I was totally, my mouth was open, like, my goodness. 2 Chronicles 16 verse 9. The eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are full of them. The God of heaven, that's, listen, the God of heaven lives inside. He lives inside everybody, the true believer. But he's searching the whole earth to strengthen those whose hearts who are fully committed. So if I'm fully committed, what's God going to do to my heart? He's going to strengthen. Well, if I'm not fully committed, when these problems all come along, where's the strength going to come from? For you through the problems. Right. If you go to Isaiah 11, verse 1 to 3, 1 to 5, you'll read this. But the seven eyes of God have set upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah 11, verse 1 to 5. And you can read yourself that. And what this that Spirit of the Lord. Spirit of wisdom, understanding, spirit of counsel, might, spirit of knowledge, the spirit of theory. Them seven four spirit, one spirit with seven attributes. Spirit of the Lord, spirit of wisdom, spirit of understanding, spirit of counsel, spirit of mind, spirit of knowledge, fear of the Lord. Now that's going to come upon you. And if you, you with that good heart, you read the word, and the Lord will give you wisdom. The Lord will give you understanding. The Lord will give you counsel. What will that do? It'll first thing make you a quick understand. In the fear of them. And listen, I never knowed any of this stuff. And all I'm just saying to you is I gave it to God and I started to obey him. And all of a sudden the word of God came alive. That's for everyone. God wants to lead you. And everybody else will try and tell you different ways. And I tell you this, you will never fulfill your own purpose to God has you. You listen to the Spirit of God and you let the Spirit lead you. And, oh dear, right. I'm saying, oh dear, it's time to hold What's this? Now? If you go through that, you'll be, you become aware, right? What is this? You'll become aware then. If you start to walk and follow God's showing you, you'll become aware of things that God starts showing you in your life. Well, listen, for the sake of time, if you read the next parable, which is the parable of the lighted candle, then the Lord, by discernment of wisdom, he will tell you, take heed to what you hear. Mark 4, verse 24. Mark 4, verse 24. I want to get to the stage where God's fulfilling the purpose for you. Now, I haven't had that long ago. Mark 4, verse 24. Take heed to what you hear. So when God starts to show you, and maybe, all of you, maybe you're allowing other people and then put into your life and all their teachings. Well, you, start, you need to take and test the spirits, the Spirit of God. Take heed to what, what the Lord's showing you. Take heed to what the Lord showed you. 
take heed to the rules. Watch them. The closer you listen, the more understanding you will get. Yeah, that's what it says in the Bible translation. Pay close attention to what you hear. The closer you listen, you, the more understanding you will get. And it says this here, and you will eat say more. So it's up to up to you what you do with the scriptures the Lord starts to with you. And the more you pay attention, God's here, God's starting to do a work in you. He lives in you, but he's starting to do a work in you. And he's trying to bring you about to your own purpose and call that's on your life. Okay. If you go to Luke 18, 8, 18, take heed to how you hear. Take heed. Let's see if got to take Mark 4, verse 24. Take heed to what you hear. A.V. Look at verse 18. Take heed to how you hear. So when God starts to show you things, are you going to apply that? Will God show you? Well, if you apply it, you're going to more understand it and more revelation. And the more the more you walk in that what God shows you, the more understanding the scripture should see it's so Right. And there's other wee verses here, but I just want to try and move on here. See this here when I'm I just show you this. Years ago I started to see these things. And I says to myself, How am I ever going to do this? How am I ever going to do that? And I'm going to show you verse Mark 1, verse 17. The Lord showed me this. Come after me, and I will make you to come. Fishers of men. When I read that verse one night, just got a long story short, I was preaching the three calls of God. And I felt, I felt the conviction of the call of God in my life. And I went to Sam Brown, the elder. He says, Sam, I heard the voice of God. What's the voice of God trying to do? Well, that's the problem. He's telling me to do something. I don't want to do it. He says, is it, is it a niche or an urge? He says, what do you mean? If it's a niche, it will go away. But if it's an urge, it will stay. <clears throat> that urge just got more and more and more. So I thought, well, my goodness, I might not have to do anything at all on what to do. I might not have to do anything But next thing all of a sudden, I'm saying these things. What's this? I read that verse in the name much later. Come after me and I will make you. I don't have to do nothing. The penny dropped. I don't have to do nothing. I just have to obey those to follow. And you talk about a weight being lifted off me. My goodness, it's floating in the air. Do you mean to say, you're going to do this, God? We here almost say here, God's love. Are you aware God's living in you? Are you aware that God wants to work in you? But He can't unless you're that is the vessel and you obey and all He wants. But He does everything. Please, He does everything. He supplies, He brings everything. You don't have to do nothing. All you have to do is come after him. Now that's not very good for the basic speaker. And I went to school and these people, this purpose, you need this, and I'm saying to Lord, your own purpose is far different than this. There's no work in your purpose. You do it, I just follow. Now what's this? I, as I was walking through this, I was went to Port Rush and I took time out to myself because of all the I was living in troubles and different things. And one day I was down in Port Stewart Beach, and all of a sudden, all those things in my head. And all of a sudden, this baby tried to move on. I thought, fuck that, I'm not doing it. And all of a sudden, I'd written there, I wrote the Catholic priest, a lot of people just scrubbed that and read that. But I was reading on through, and I turned to the back page, and let me see what I read. First Thessalonians chapter 5. I, I went out to that beach, and I was just slightly hooked. Not, not, uh, first Christ, 5, verse 23. And the very God of 
peace shall sanctify you. You'll not make Israel one, but I will make you one. Have you ever said that? Why will he make me holy? Because I was a little this. And I used to think, I have to do this and I have to do this. No. What's this do? Very God of peace sanctify you, and I pray your whole spirit and body be preserved blameless. God's going to preserve your spirit, your soul, and your body blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I says, how will that work? The next thing I read the next verse. Faithful is he that called you, also. I will do. I will do. But it's only for those who have yoked with a good heart and soul rest. Not in soul rest. Yoke yourself to God. Now what's this for you? I imagine you yoke here. I got a revelation of my soul. One day I was reading, it says Matthew 11, verse 28, 29. Take my yoke upon you. Turn me the first one. Come on to me, all your family, and I will give you rest. That's a rest in your spirit for you receiving sins forgiven by calling on the Lord. Mm. It's given. It's free. And it's preaching something you have to add to. It's free. You don't have to not. You have to just receive it. Call upon Come on to me, all your I will give you rest. Next rest. Take my yoke upon you. This your yoke must be taken. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, and you will find rest. That's the soul rest. You have you, your soul, body, and members. Now, heal it, your soul, body, and members, and obeying God. Now, you have your soul rest. What's this, you best, Mark? Matthew 11, verse. I can quote it here, but I want to. Please, again, read these scriptures and read them and read them to your revelation. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Learn of the Lord Jesus Christ, for I am making look to your heart, and you will find rest for your soul. See when you have soul rest, but I tell you this. What does it mean to be in rest? What does it mean to be in rest? I'll tell you this. You're chilling out. You're let everybody else do what you want. The Lord hasn't told you to do it. We will tell you a joke. Years ago, this man had done a bit of work with the guys and stopped it. So that he was outside and he's having a smoke. And this young boy came up, he said, What are you at? I'm resting. I said, What are you resting about? Well, I've all the work done for the day, my money made. Well, you should go and maybe get somebody else and start with the guys at Korea. And what would I do then, son? He says, no, You can get somebody work on there. And then if you, if you haven't done that, then you go to Balabi and start another one. And what would I do then, son? He says, You can go home and eventually get shut up and rest. He says, What do you think I'm doing, son? Mm -hmm. Enter this man. Please, watch this. Go to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9 10. There remaineth the rest for the people of God. For he that has entered his rest, he's also ceased from his own works. If you haven't ceased from doing your own thing, you have never entered this rest. You're doing your own thing. Or you're trying to make this happen. Or you're trying to do that. God's rest is a place where you just chill out. And you listen to the voice of the Lord. Now go try in the next five, ten minutes, bring you across how God's going to make your purpose about it. Because you're uh, you're the best vessel. God lives in you. Now God is starting to work. I want to show you verses where God starts to work with you, okay? Uh, go with me to Philippians 2, verse 13. Now, he's only working in those that are against the yoke, please. But he wants to work in his ones. And there's other people out here, but they're operating and they're motivated and they're trying to do things and get you to the world to do all this other stuff. But they really don't have they have taken you out of rest. And most of the people will burn out. And then when circumstances come along, then they give up. That was never meant to be. Right, go to Philippians uh, chapter 2.13. A.V. 
for it is God that which work within you, both to will and to do. For it is God, that's the God lives in you. But God wants to work in you. For it is God that work within you. Has God ever started to work in you? When you're yielded and you're obeying its voice and you're yoked, then God can do the work in you. It is God that work within you to will and to do of his good pleasure. And can I tell you this? There's no work in us. It's yielding and yoked with that too. So what about the will of God? What the, God says there, for it's God that work within you to both to will and to do. So you're doing this. That's what you can understand. Nobody ever showed me this. I was doing all this work and I was trying this. And finally I got to the conclusion that I can't do this. And the Lord says, I can do it. Have you got to that stage yet? Have you, have you got to the stage where you're burnt out, trying all this, trying what everybody else says? Well, you're, you may be in a better place than most people. Right, what's this? Hebrews, Hebrews chapter uh, Hebrews chapter 13. God has a purpose for you. God wants to bring, let you bring that hand, bring that purpose about. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of sheep, sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect. In every good work, that's the work God's going to do. He's going to make you perfect. In every good work, to do as well. He's going to do it. Right? Working in you. That which is well pleasing to us. It may not be pleasing to you. But there's a listen, there's a great work to be done. And all he's looking for is a vessel to flow through. Yielded and yoked. And can I tell you this? You will finish the if you keep going on and following, you will finish the call of God you right. And you'll receive the prize in the coming day. But what's this you got here if I can just show you this? Just to show it without a shadow of doubt, God's working in you. God wants to work in you. And God is working some Working in you. Make you perfect in every good work to do his will. Working in you that which is well pleasing to his sight. <clears throat> through Jesus Christ to whom we go with forever. How does he work through you? Okay now. Colossians chapter 1 verse 20. Well, you need to be yielded, yoked, and the sevenfold spirit. I know all you're doing is falling and missing the baby says. Right. And there's something inside us. We have, we self-destruct ourselves to think we have to do something. Right. Colossians, Colossians chapter 1, verse 29. I'm going to read verse 28. Whom we preach, warning every man, Excuse me, teaching every man and all wisdom that we represent every man perfect in Christ. For I unto I labour, striving. So Paul was striving and labour. Okay, according to his word, he was striving and he was working, but it wasn't him. It was the God of heaven and he was doing the work. What's this? According to his work, which work within me might. And see when God starts to get you and he starts to flow through you, he will stretch you. And he will stretch you. And can I tell you this, you'll be doing all this other stuff, but I won't be you be doing it. Yeah. And I'll be saying, you must study this. No, 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 the Lord's doing it. But he wants to stretch you and stretch you more. Please, I want to show you one more verse for one percent. Let me show you this. Stuff. Now, listen, let me see if I find this just a rough down just going to try and put it right. Philippians 2 13, right, uh, Hebrews, right, okay, then. Colossians 1 29, 1 Corinthians 15 10. 
See, when we see the get in there, we see the, whole, the, the angel of the Lord comes to get in. The Lord is with him. They made him on a power. He did not see himself. Because he did. For he's seen all his problems. And all the nation of Israel problems. God seen the man. To bring the nation of Israel out of the problems. And see the, see the gift God wants you. God wants to empower you. That you have empathy. To help the rest of the body of Christ. You, people, a lot of people have sympathy. But they haven't empathy. What's this now? 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 10 By the grace of God I am what I am and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not vain for I laboured more upon than they all yet not I but the grace of God in me God by his grace will work in you and can I tell you this people will see this yet of grace working please for they see it and I just want to show you and I'm going to finish it that's what I'm going to say here. It's not by self. That's the spirit of the word. And the programs that were inspired by your strength. But it's God working in us. Producing us. That's not, that's not these four words. Inspiring you. Equipping you. Perfecting you. Fulfilling his purpose. In you. I'm going to show you these verses. Psalm 138, verse 8. <laughs> the Lord will perfect that with certainty. Who will the, do it? Oh, but you don't understand the problems I have. The Lord will perfect that which concerns you. you do it, the oh Lord. But if you're standing stuck, you're trying to do it. It's time you move to say, and let the Lord do it. Now, I read these verses earlier. One here, just will show you Psalm 57, verse 1 and 2 again. Psalm, Psalm 57. I'm going to read them out of two versions, A, B, and maybe can you let me the passion. Psalm 57, verse 1 and 2. Be merciful unto me, O God, be merciful, for my soul trusts in thee, yea, and the shadow of the wings will I. Take my rushes until these calamities do. So there's calamities here. And they're overcoming him. And he's crying out to God. Okay. I will cry unto God most high. And then he says this. Unto God that performs all things for me. So he knew. He went to God with prayer. And I, have, I haven't time. You haven't time. I, you had to learn to commit it. You need to learn to call to God with everything. And you need to learn this, realize this. It's God that performs all things. I come. And see if you read that verse, you let the translation. Psalm 57. See, there's people today, and they're so weighed down with all the circumstances, problems, and life. And they have never again been told that they are to call God. Cried it. Psalm 57. Have mercy on me, O God, you live and have mercy. I look to you for protection. Who should look to for protection? The Lord. I will hide beneath the shadow of your wings until the dangers. There's the secret. It's the Lord. On the secret. Next verse. I cry out to the God most high, to God who will fulfill his purposes for me. I read her down Who's going to fulfill my his purpose? He's going to. And all I have to do is let him. I haven't time to forsake or something like that. That's the same. Who you to Psalm 37. And you read from verse 1 to maybe 8. And you read this Psalm 37. Very, very quick. I go with trust in He says, Psalm is a revelation. Trust in the Lord. That's verse 2. Next verse. Delight thyself in the Lord. And he'll give you the desires of heart. Three, trust in the Lord. Sorry, commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust unto him, and he shall bring things. Mm -hmm. And the next verse says, On thy righteousness, 
and he shall bring forth a righteousness. He will bring forth your righteousness. When you learn to commit all that stuff, why does that be better? Right? Verse 7. Rest in the Lord and wait patient for him. Remember I told you the joke the man's done. What am I doing? I'm taking things easy. I'm rest. It's time you get a revelation. If God's not telling you anything to do, just chill up and put your feet up. And wait for him. And when he moves, you move. A couple of things before this. First one, fret not yourself. Stop fretting and get yourself into problems. And verse 8. Sorry, 9. 8. Cease from anger. That will stop God's good people. And here's the key. It's learning to realise God wants to fulfil his purpose and vessel of the one we left with. It's two things I'm going to say. Be aware of God's presence living in you. Be aware and draw nigh to God and separate yourself from things and sing and be happy and be joyful and chill out in the manifest presence of God. And be aware that God wants to fulfill his own purpose in you. Please, just want to pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for everyone here and everyone behind them. Father, we just pray that all the rest of the church who is striving to do things, do things. Father, may their eyes be open to realise that you want to do the work in them. Father, you live in them. But Father, we just pray that you do this work in us. And each one of us. And we pray the blessing of God upon each and every one. And we take authority over principalities and powers and bind everything. And Father, we pray everyone will experience the manifest presence of God in these days of my head. We thank you for it.